Hi, I'm Mitch, and welcome to the Restoration Road, where my guest today is my second of four daughters, Kelsey Herber, coach, <laughs> head coach of yes. Huntington University Volleyball. I am ready, coach. I really appreciate that. I didn't wear my gear, so I'm glad you did. <laughs> um, thank you for joining us, and uh, I just want to glean from your wisdom. You got your master's in counseling. You're now counseling students at Huntington University as well. How's that going? I absolutely love it. I've read somewhere that 90% of college females will experience some kind of anxiety uh, in their early college years and 45% um, maybe even into depression. Mm -hmm. I assume those are the most kind of issues that you deal with? Yeah, absolutely. I would say definitely anxiety and depression are the two things that um, we end up talking about the most with the students that I see. And so Unfortunately, it is something that's very prevalent in the lives of many people, but specifically college students just going through um, all that change and looking forward to the future can naturally create a lot of anxiety as well. Um, so that's definitely two things we talk about quite a bit. The Bible talks about anxiety being a divided inner being. Mm -hmm. It's kind of one foot in with God, one foot in with myself, and we trust in ourselves more than we trust in God and that creates an issue because we um, know in the end we're really not all that. We're not going to be able to control every um, thing in our lives, and we're not going to be able to micromanage every outcome. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm asking more of what's going on culturally where you think that's such a big issue. Culturally, what's happening on the outside is there is this pressure that our lives should look a certain way, mm. or we should act a certain way, or we should be perceived a certain way. And at the end of the day, that can eat us alive inside if we don't feel like we're meeting those standards, or if we don't feel like we fit into that box um, that society tries to say we need to fit into. And it can become exhausting, both mentally and emotionally. Yeah, for sure. Um, Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, it seems like they're the ultimate go-to verses for this kind of issue. Um, David writes, uh, search me, O God, and know my heart. So experience me. It's talking about an intimacy with God. And if there's any anxious thought, if there's anything in me where I have one foot in and one foot out with you and I'm trusting in myself, you know, make that new again, my paraphrase, and lead me in the way of everlasting. So that's a prayer that we really should dial into is David's prayer in order to, to find that healing. Um, I wanna talk to you today about coaching female athletes. Yes. You uh, um, have one season in, mm -hmm. and you have the most successful uh, season in Huntington University history since uh, the legend, uh, Dave Schrader, <laughs> uh, finished his, what, 13 years as head coach, I think? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, so, Things are are turning around in a in a real positive way. Um, you're building a culture. You're a cultural architect. Um, so I, I want to talk to you today about um, your philosophy mm -hmm. on coaching female athletes and see what we can learn from it. I've had four daughters, mm -hmm. um, and I have strong uh, beliefs in this area as well. But um, First of all, could you just start by what you wanted to do first to shape the culture to be the way that you thought God was leading you to do it? Yeah, and and I want to say to start off by saying I have learned a lot in this first season. Um, and so I hope nobody thinks by any means that I think I have it all figured out and know the exact right way to do things. Um, I've been really humbled in this first season and have learned a lot. Um, but one thing that has stood out to me the most is I am so passionate about this. I love my girls and I'm so thankful I get to do this. Um, but when I found out I had the opportunity to step into the head coach role, I was extremely excited and I, I thought about what needs to happen first because instantly all these things rush to my mind of, I wanna do this and I wanna do this and I want this to change and I want this to grow. Um, but what it really came down to is I knew that to start, 
at the end of the day, my players need to know that they are loved and they are valued. And so mm. when I first was named the head coach, we were in season. So I had an off season for a few months before we even started in the fall. And one of my personal goals was I'm going to build my relationships with my players. Um, that way there is that foundation going into the season that they know I love them. I value them. I care about them. That way in those moments, if, if there's a hard situation where I need to call you out on something or there's days where I'm pushing you beyond what you think you're able to do, there's that foundation of love. Um, and that was extremely important to me going into it. That's really uh, cool because uh, you've known Kelly Bird your whole life and mm -hmm. his son Russell uh, was at a precipice of making a final decision on where he was going to play college basketball back in the day. And um, Tom Izzo and, and Michigan State University ended up being at the top of that list. And mm -hmm. one of the things Kelly and I talked about privately that he wouldn't care if I shared was, hey, Izzo's going to get in his grill mm -hmm. a lot. How do you think he's going to handle that? Uh, and we compared that to the way some of the other coaches operated in their programs that were in the top of his list. And he said something I'll never forget. He said he can take it because he knows coach loves him. Mm -hmm. And that's huge. Uh, love and discipline go together. And uh, I remember I was mentoring um, a coach. I was one of many voices in this tremendous emerging leader's life. Um, but we noticed that playing time was his only currency of love. And so the kids who maybe didn't train as much in the off season and couldn't contribute as much in the tight, intense games, um, they would interpret not playing as coach doesn't really care for me. And um, we talked about doing something his coach had done in college, and that is he would spend 15 minutes, maybe 30, um, each week with each player. Mm, and I so playing time wasn't the only currency mm -hmm. so of love. So I love that you're doing that. Thank so you. you and I came up with four things yes. on coaching female athletes. I want to walk you through them okay. and, uh, and get your uh, insight on each one of them. All right. First one is define roles. Yes. Why is defining a role so important for players on a team? Mm. At the end of the day, if someone knows what their role is and is able to truly embrace that, if every single player on a team is able to do that, watch out world in terms of what that team can accomplish mm. through Christ. Um, I think it's so important because it sets the stage for this is what my coaches and my teammates need from me. And so then every single day that they go into practice, every single time they go into a match, they know this is my role. That has been defined for me. And so I need to make sure that every time I'm on that court, this is what I bring um, in order for the betterment of the entire team. And so I just think that's extremely important. And when every single person embraces that, it's beautiful. Um, and one thing I thought about in preparing for this was the fact that that's sometimes on a large scale and sometimes it's on a small scale. Hmm. Um, so for example, we nominated captains um, in my first season and- You let the team do that or the coaches do that? So we had a discussion about it, um, coaches and players, okay. but then the players are the ones who then nominated each other and voted. And what was really important in that conversation was I said, I need to clearly define what a captain is and what I expect from them before you even vote, because you need to know what we are looking for, um, what standards a captain is held to. That way, one, they knew who they should vote for, somebody who they felt fit those characteristics, but two, so they knew if they wanted to be one or not. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was really important. And that was kind of more on a larger scale within the team. However, um, there was one match where um, I had a player go in who hadn't played quite as much so far in the season. And before she went in, I told her, hey, your job going in here right now is to block their outside hitter. That's the one thing I want you to focus on. Um, and come to find out, a few days later, we talked about the match and how well she did going in. And, and she said to me, she said, that, I love that you told me 
what that one specific role was for me to focus on because then I was able to know exactly what I was supposed to do. And so there was no question of what does she really want for me right now? She knew I'm supposed to go block that outside. And so I think it's important to define roles not only on a large scale, but even in those small uh, moments within a match or a practice. That's huge. I was going to ask you to give me an example of what def how, how you define a role. Yeah. Tell me how you define a role more in a macro basis for a girl for the whole season. Mm, mm -hmm. uh, everything from their posi her position to what you want from her in that position and maybe how much or how little she might see the court. Yeah, I think one thing that's very important with that is to include the player into that. Um, so at the end of the day, I can sit there and I can tell her, my vision for her on this team, but I learn a lot by asking them first, by first saying, what do you want your role to be? What do you envision it being to get their input? They may say something that I hadn't thought of that would be a great thing for them to embrace in terms of their role. Mm. And so I think that's really important to include them in that conversation. Um, but also just to be able to say, here are the qualities I see in you that I want to make sure that are heightened within this team. And I think what happens in those moments is there is a little bit of that, wow, like someone recognized that in me. They may not recognize it in themselves. Maybe they do. But hearing that from the coach saying, hey, I see this quality in you. So this, this is what I'm looking for from you this season. Um, I think can really build a lot of um, a lot of motivation in the player to do that. And sometimes that turns into hard conversations. Maybe somebody um, isn't going to see the floor as much as they thought they might. And sometimes those can be hard conversations, but at the end of the day, hearing the truth um, and knowing where you stand, I think is far better than candy coating and yes. then frustration that comes later from not feeling like what you promised wasn't delivered. That's outstanding. Um, I'm thinking about in defining roles in scripture, um, there are three wills of God that come out of the scriptures. One is the absolute will of God, what he's gonna do, and nobody can stop him from it. Mm -hmm. And that's stuff like when uh, Jesus returns, mm -hmm. uh, salvation by grace through faith, that's no, but no man's idea, that's God's idea. Um, there's the approval of God, Abraham go, where he presses upon you and he, and he says, you know, maybe even to Paul, when Jesus appears to Paul, this is your role and this is what I want you to do. Uh, and then there's the allowable will of God, like the Garden of Eden, even to choose apart from him. So mm -hmm. God um, also defines roles. Mm -hmm. Jesus defined roles with his disciples. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really, really powerful. Mm -hmm. um, number two, establish expectations. And I'd like you to build upon how this is different from defining roles and and what exactly is establishing expectations? Mm -hmm. Well, I think you can look at this potentially from a few different angles. Um, what initially comes to my mind is this idea of discipline within my team. Now, I feel like that word always has this negative yes, connotation mm -hmm. that I'm saying, get your butt on the end line. Mm -hmm. We're sprinting until you feel like you're going to puke mm -hmm. and I'm angry and I'm screaming. Mm -hmm. um, that's really not the view of discipline that I have. Um, I believe discipline at the end of the day is establishing the expectation, saying, this is what I expect from you. And then because you clearly know what the expectations are, if we don't meet them, whether that's individually or as a team, there's going to be some type of consequence to remind us of the expectations that are set. And so my team knows, um, at least I sure hope they do. I think if you would ask every single player on my team, what are the two biggest things that Kelsey is looking for, for each player to bring every day? And those two things are attitude and effort because they're the two things you can control yeah. every single day. Mm -hmm. And so that's just one example of those are the expectations I've set on my team. So if I don't feel like our team is giving that full effort, we're going to address that. We're not going to let it just keep going. We're going to stop. We're going to do something to remind ourselves um, about why that expectation is in place. And to know that in order to build a program, in order to be as successful as I know they can be, we have to hold ourselves to that standard. Um, 
And then in terms of attitude, those can be some really tough conversations. And that's when it comes into play that I think it, that foundation of love is really important because there's times where I'm going to need to sit down with the player and say, hey, this is what I'm seeing. This doesn't fit um, the expectations we've set for this team. Mm -hmm. Um, Another thing that, you know, just like I said, that in defining a role, it's important to pull the player into that. Um, Expectations for this team, I think, is another great opportunity to include the players in on that conversation. So we had a goal setting meeting at the beginning of the season where I said, you tell me. You tell me what you want our goals to be and what you think the expectations for this team should be. And of course, I got to include um, my perspective as well. But at the end of the day, when you feel like you are a part of defining the expectations and you feel like you are a part of setting the goals, you take ownership of it. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I just go in and say, here are your three goals this season, Mm -hmm. okay, they didn't have a say. And so I think that was an important piece of it too. That's really good. Um, They take more ownership when they are part of the process. Mm -hmm. And you see Jesus did that with his disciples. He spent, you know, every day with them uh, for a few years. And when he sent out the 12, when he sent out the 72, he gave them, he established uh, very clear expectations. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we can learn a bunch from that. Mm -hmm. Uh, So number one, define roles in coaching female athletes. Number two, establish expectations. Number three is to affirm daily. Mm -hmm. Why is daily affirmation so important to a female? And that word daily is the (laughs) most important piece of what you just said. Because I'll be honest, um, I'll be really transparent. This is something going into my first season as head coach that I thought I was really good at. I have been so humbled this season to realize that there is still room for growth in that area for me. Because I truly believe you can't affirm too much. Um, That verbal affirmation of, I see what you're doing, and you're doing it well, and I'm proud of you, it means so much. I even tell people, I can run on a good compliment for like a week. (laughs) It fuels me like nothing else. And, And I think it is such a motivator, such an encourager. And somebody once told me that females really need to hear what they're doing right. Yes, as a coach, I need to point out what we can improve in, Mm -hmm. what someone did wrong. Um, I'm not saying it's the absence of that. However, they also need you to point out what they've done well. I can't just assume they know. Um, I actually had one of our matches this season. Um, Overall, we played an outstanding match. There was just one area that we let our guard down in, and that's what lost the match for us. Mm. Um, We weren't picking up tips. We played an outstanding match that was just that one thing. But I was so frustrated that that one thing got to us that in the post-match chat, what do you think the one thing I talked about was? Picking up tips. Mm -hmm. And, And they could tell I was frustrated with that because that was something we could choose to do. And that was solely what my post-match talk revolved around. And then that night I went home and I thought, I didn't say specifically what they did well. And I had one player in mind who I thought, you know what? She probably walked away from that match hearing the one thing I wanted her to do better when she played in an outstanding match as a whole. And so I went home that night, I took out a note card, and I wrote 10 things that she did well that match. Oh, my word. Because it was easy to think of 10 things. Mm -hmm. And I met with her the next day, and I handed her that note card, and I said, I have a feeling that last night you walked away with the one thing that I wanted you to do better. I said, but the reality is, here are all the things I thought you did well. Um, And I'm sorry I didn't verbalize that to you because I knew she felt defeated after that match. And Was that in private? The 10 things she did well. That part was in private. Um, However, when I got to practice the next day, I said, 
girls, last night, we know that that was the one thing that got us last night. We lost the match because we couldn't pick up tips. However, I'm realizing that I did not point out what we did well specifically. And so as a team in front of everybody, so not privately, each girl, I pointed to them and said, you did this very well. You did this very well. I saw you do this. Wow. Um, because I felt like that was a moment where I needed to grow in, in affirming. And instead of getting so caught up in the one thing that we didn't do well, um, yes, we need to fix it. But I also feel like I needed to acknowledge the good mm. and, and affirm them in that. That's really good. Um, Paul says that we should build up others with our words according to their needs, you know, in Christ, that it might benefit all those who listen. Don't use uh, unwholesome talk. Don't let a unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, which he is juxtaposing that with building up. So mm -hmm. unwholesome talk tears it down. Um, can you define how you can affirm the individual yet still correct mm -hmm. without tearing them down? Absolutely. Um when I have to correct something in an individual, um, I think it's important. You know, a lot of times people talk about that sandwich method of yes. compliment. Here's something, here's some constructive mm -hmm. criticism, compliment. Mm -hmm. I honestly believe that's very helpful in coaching um, and specifically coaching females. If there's an area I really want a player to step up in or grow in or really focus on, um, I think it's nice to accompany that with here's something you're doing really well. And then I think you growing in this area takes your game to a whole nother level. That's good. Um, and so I think it's important to include that in those conversations. Here's what you're doing well. However, at the end of the day, we know that truth plus grace equals perfect love. Mm. So if I only affirm what my team does well and never challenge them to grow, never point out an area that we're struggling in, never point out an area... Um, that an individual player needs to grow in, I am not loving them well. So it's a combination of both. And I think that's extremely important. Um, it's not just one or the other. So I believe those conversations need to include both the truth and the grace um, to say, here's the accountability piece, here's what you can grow in, but I love you and here's what you're doing well. And the only, and I've told my girls, um, the only reason I ever get on you and push you in this way is because I see what you can be and I love you. Mm -hmm. If I didn't love you, I would just let that go. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's really important in those conversations. Jesus did daily affirmation. I mean, he did life with his disciples. So it, it models that. And uh, he said a new commandment I give you, which is basically a, ren a renewal of God's ultimate command to, to love God and love each other. Uh, to live that out vertically and horizontally mm -hmm. in your relationships. And uh, that leads us to what you and I thought we needed a fourth. Yes. <laughs> and we both came together yes. separately. And uh, you came up with, there has to be a, rena a relational connection. So we define roles, we establish expectations, we affirm daily, we connect relationally uh, with wisdom and love. And wisdom and love is something that I thought was missing mm -hmm. and connect relationally is something you thought was missing. Uh, let's talk about the importance of that. Yeah. The fact that I have the opportunity to disciple these girls and to help them grow in their faith, I believe is the most important part of the opportunity I have to invest in them. And when I meet with recruits, I never want them to be blindsided by what my number one goal is. So I want to be very transparent from the beginning so they know what they'd be getting. And I tell them, I said, at the end of the day, if I have the opportunity to coach somebody for four years and they become a much better volleyball player by the end of those four years, but they can't say they grew at all in their relationship with Christ or grew in their faith, I truly believe at that point I have failed because that is the most important piece of what I get to do. Um, and being able to have, um, being able to have the opportunity to disciple them and invest in them in that way, there has to be once again, that foundation of relationship and I love you. Um, 
And so I think that's extremely important. And so I'm really glad we added that. <laughs> that's really cool. Um, I think whatever you communicate, it has to be the truth and love, like you're saying, and that's where wisdom uh, and love meet. Um, if you truly care about your players, um, you're going to think about how are they processing mm -hmm. what I'm saying, and you start seeing things through their eyes. Yes, you're casting a vision. Yes, you're leading them to something mm -hmm. that may be a little challenging and difficult, or they do it on their own, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's something that they're not going to do on their own, but your job is to get yourself out of a job. Discipline yes. is teach, train, test, transform. And so teach is I do, you watch. It's like showing them uh, the way the drill's going to go. Yeah. Um, train is I do you help to come alongside it's kind of it's kind of like then they they're doing the drill yeah. kind of a thing test is you do I help and in terms of uh, practice plan it is uh, um, the scrimmage probably mm -hmm. and then the impurities come to the top and that's where uh, we have transform or the correction that takes place and that's your job is to get yourself out of a job. And that is you do, I watch. Some say you do, I pray. So Kelsey, I just uh, can't thank you enough for sharing all your insights uh, on these four things, defining roles, establishing expectations, affirming daily, and connecting relationally with wisdom and love. And you know where I got to in this was, this isn't just for females, mm -hmm. <laughs> this works for men too. Uh, if you're coaching young men, these four things got to take place. Kelsey, what would you say to someone watching who maybe is leading a group of females and struggling a little bit? What would you say to them today? At the end of the day, with whoever you're interacting with, whatever type of relationship it is, there is something powerful about knowing you are chosen. My high school softball coach, he used to end every letter he wrote us with, I choose you to be on my team any day. And that's something that I've adopted in my own coaching career to say to my team, because at the end of the day, knowing that you are chosen, you are loved, somebody wants you on their team, that is powerful. It is such a motivator. And at the end of the day, I think that is truly the sweet spot um, of where our relationship with Christ intersects with our relationship with others. Amen, thank you, Kelsey. Hi, I'm Maria. Join us on Restoration Road next week. Mm -hmm.